When it comes to tuning, late model cars is becoming increasingly difficult to replace the factory ECU with an aftermarket standalone ECU that's easily tunable by aftermarket tuners. This is because modern cars rely on intricate communications between a variety of electronic control modules in order to make everything work properly. I'm talking here about aspects such as the automatic transmission, even your gauge cluster and your air conditioning. So for late model cars, the more popular technique has been reflashing the factory ECU. Essentially this is a technique where we can download the fa factory data out of the ECU, manipulate it in the same way that the OE calibration engineers do so and then flash it back into the ECU. Of course as time has gone on even this is becoming increasingly complex and we're here with Chris from Banks Power to talk about an alternative solution for tuning factory ECUs. So Chris, first of all just talking about the problem I just highlighted there, it is getting increasingly difficult to reflash these factory ECUs, can you tell us what are the problems they're facing these aftermarket reflashing companies, why is it getting harder for them? So the OEM uh, manufacturers are actually basically encrypting these ECUs to the point that uh, no one can crack them. So I think historically people are getting kind of inside information to be able to figure out how to unencrypt them, but it's just getting harder and harder for everyone to do it. So we're finding uh, many modern vehicles are kind of hitting a block wall there. And the L5P, which is the latest generation of GM's 6.6 litre V8 diesel turbo engines, uh, that's a, a case in point here. When that was originally released, it wasn't uh, something that could be tuned. Could you tell us why, what was the problem there? Was that the encryption? Yeah, that's mostly the encryption. So eventually someone found out, I guess, that you can crack open the ECU and go through a pretty extensive process to uh, replace some of the components to actually get past that. Uh, but it's, it's definitely not user friendly to make that happen. So, yeah, we, We've gone through that with our own development vehicle and it's not user friendly, you're right, particularly from our side of the world we have to send the ECU all the way to the US. It's also an incredibly expensive process where that factory processor uh, is actually removed from the board and then replaced with one that's, that's then programmable. So let's talk about your alternatives. What is it that Banks Power have developed and how does this work? So we have a product called the Derringer which is an inline tuner. Uh, inline tuner is really nothing new, it's been around for at least 20 or 30 years now. Uh, but what we've done is we've modernized it by taking the OBD2 data off the ECU and using that to basically refine the calibration and make it more safe than anyone else. Okay, so let's talk about the terminology you've used there. First of all, inline tuner. So this isn't a, a reflash, you're not actually modifying the factory ECU at all, it is just left completely intact and this is an add-on module. And where, where do you add this into the system? Yeah, that's correct. So this is a plug and play module where uh, we intercept a couple of different signals on a diesel engine like the L5P. It's going to be the fuel roll pressure and the manifold pressure sensor. So what it does, it takes the input data into the from the sensor into the control module, the Derringer. It looks at those sensor uh, values along with the ECU data and determines how much uh, extra fuel rail and extra manifold pressure we can add to it. And it amends the signals to basically check the engine to uh, give us extra boost or extra fuel rail pressure. So in very, very basic terms, if we just dumb this down, one of the ways we can get a lot more power out of a diesel engine is by adding additional fuel. So let's just deal with that for a start. So in order to do that, you're intercepting the fuel rail pressure signal. So can you tell us what the Derringer does in order to get more fuel into the engine? Okay, so the Derringer, um, the L5P has two signals. It's a rising and a falling signal. Uh, so we intercept both of those and look at it. So let's say it's commanding 2,000 bar of fuel oil pressure, and we know that's 4.0 volts. So we want to basically add 300 bar uh, to that. So we'll basically say that now uh, we'll output the signal as 1,700 bar, so maybe that's uh, 3.8 volts. And the ECU looks at that and says, hey, I'm not making enough fuel oil pressure. Uh, so it'll turn up the fuel pump and basically try to raise the pressure back up to that. So now we have the, dish, the original 2,000 bar plus the new 300 bar. So we essentially raise the fuel pressure by 300 bar. So basically you're just lying to the factory ECU, tr tricking the signal, telling it it doesn't have as much fuel pressure as it is uh, wanting to achieve, so it will then raise that fuel pressure. And can you just tell us how that additional fuel pressure results in more fuel being delivered into the engine? So basically since the injectors are, um, the quantity of fuel injected is a function of the pressure as long as the on time. Uh, so the, the inline tuners don't change the on time, it just changes the pressure. But with that higher pressure, uh, you have more quantity of fuel, uh, better atomization as well. So there's some other benefits there, um, which gives you more, more power. So basically you're holding the injector, or the factory ECU is holding the injector on for the same pulse width, but because there's more fuel pressure or differential pressure across the injector, more fuel is being delivered into the cylinder for that period of time. Now, 
the problem is if we just add fuel, we are going to make more power, but we end up with a richer air fuel ratio, we end up creating a lot more heat, we also end up with potential for creating smoke in the exhaust system. Not great when we're talking about emissions equipped vehicles. So the other aspect of that there that you mentioned is the manifold pressure signal. So you're intercepting that and cheating that signal as well. What's the effect of doing that? So by adding the extra fuel, like you said, you're going to get rich conditions, you're going to have extra soot, higher EGTs. Um, you're basically going to be lim limited in the amount of power that you can have before you run into these limit uh, limitations. So by adding, uh, intercepting the manifold pressure and tricking it to add extra air or boost pressure, uh, you bring the air fuel ratio back to its original level. Um, that's the goal at least, and that gives you better control of the EGTs, uh, less chance of having excess soot, and um, basically a safer, um, more sustainable power level. All right, that all makes sense and these technologies as you've mentioned they're not new you haven't really uh, created anything new here in terms of uh, something to cheat those signals they've been around for a while but conventionally what I have seen with these piggyback modules that do exactly that is they just cheat the fuel pressure and the map signal everywhere and this is where the the bank's power Derringer uh, does go a little bit further with that OBD2 signal so can you talk to us about how you're using that signal and how you're manipulating the manifold pressure and fuel pressure signals as a result Result of that. Okay, so our Derringer connects to the I-1.8, which is the OBD2 gauge. Uh, so that's basically the control unit that's getting all the information and sending it to the Derringer. And we're using things such as EGT, uh, um, let's see, Translip, EGR uh, activity, uh, RPM, and um, AFR as well to kind of basically fine tune the calibration. So when we calibrate the device, we look at exactly when the, the ECU kind of catches that there's something going on and that something's uh, not quite normal. So we can fine tune the calibration to adjust the amount of fuel and the most amount of air in those particular spots to make sure that we give the absolute best performance possible without having any issues like check engine lights. Yeah, so that, that uh, interface with the OBD2 port allows you a lot more uh, control over exactly when and where you're delivering that fuel as well as the safety elements there with the monitoring aspects such as the EGT. And you just touched on the uh, factory ECU knowing that something's not right and I wanted to just dig into that in a bit more detail because of course as we've seen the ECUs become more and more sophisticated uh, they you can't go sort of crazy with fuel pressure or manifold pressure because the ECU will pick up something's not right so what sort of development do you do to figure out exactly how far you can push these things and, and where the limits lie? So we just do a very thorough calibration job on the, the, um, on the product itself so we slowly creep up on it we add diff um, more and more fuel more and more air and we kind of find the optimal level and then once we, if we do run into some kind of limitation such as a check engine light because of the fuel roll pressure signal, uh, we'll look at exactly where that occurred using freeze frame data or the data log that we take when we're calibrating and then from there try to figure out what we can do to um, avoid that from happening. So things like changing the calibration in that one spot or ramping in or changing the rate of uh, which we're amending the signals, um, stuff like that. And can you give me some indication, let's say for example the L5P, obviously one we're personally interested in, what sort of gains over a stock calibration are you seeing with the Derringer installed? So we're seeing about 60 horsepower, um, 100 pound-feet of torque, right around there, and also if you add our uh, air intake system, uh, we, we found ways to kind of change the EGR activity add additional 20 horsepower. So if you have uh, both of those two products combined, about 80 horsepower. Yeah, that's a, a decent increase and the other aspect there, assume that uh, that's going to be a safe calibration regardless whether you're, tow you're driving around in an unladen truck or you're towing a massive load up a, a long hill. Yeah, that's correct. And we also have active uh, safety features. So we're the only inline tuner product to use bypass relays. Uh, so let's say some signal is out of the norm or you kind of lose power to something. Uh, our product will have relays that automatically snap the signal back to stock and completely bypass everything. So. Uh, that's another feature that helps keep the vehicle safe and running smoothly. Now as well as the Derringer, you do have uh, a range of gauges for displaying a variety of different information. I'm just interested in diving into those. Obviously the more data that we can gather, the more thorough we, we can sort of analyse how the engine's performing, particularly when you're developing calibrations like you are, then this gives you a lot more information to know uh, the quality of your tune. But I'm just interested in sort of finding out a little bit more about how you get the data into these gauges. So can you tell us how they work? Okay, so the gauge itself plugs into the OBD2 port and it'll uh, read everything that the ECU has to offer. Uh, so we have a program for pretty much every single mode one parameter um, that's available as well as quite a handful of vehicle specific proprietary parameters. 
So this, this means basically even if you don't want to add any additional sensors, you plug that straight into the OBD2 port and you've got all of the basic parameters and potentially some more advanced depending on which uh, particular vehicle you're dealing with. Yeah, on some of the modern diesels we're seeing over 80 parameters just from plugging into the ECU by itself, so it's pretty extensive. And, if, and then if you want to go a little bit further, maybe you want to add something unique, maybe you want to analyse that turbo performance in a little bit more detail, maybe add some pressure and temperature pre and post turbocharger or turbo speed, how could we go about doing that? So yeah, the system is expandable for up to four I-dash gauges to monitor everything, and then from there you can also add sensor modules. Uh, so we have a five-channel analog module which has four analog pressure, or temperature, or zero to five volt signals, along with one frequency input. So you can do stuff like RPM or turbo speed. Um, you can have up to six of those on one system, as well as we have a four-channel thermocouple module which gives you four EGTs or any thermocouple input um, that could be read into the I-dash 1.8 and you simply configure it on the gauge itself to say this is uh, channel A is a pressure sensor, it's in the manifold, uh, channel B is a temperature sensor, it's in the manifold. And we also uh, automatically calculate uh, special parameters for analysis, uh, things like manifold air density, which we hold a patent on, uh, displaying and monitoring that system. So um, I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with manifold density, but the iDash will automatically display that to you uh, in real time so you can data log it, monitor and kind of evaluate the performance. So it means you don't have to go and calculate that for yourself. Yeah. Now, in terms of data logging, is this purely through the gauge or is the, the ability to uh, data log and then analyze in a bit more detail on a laptop software? So the gauge itself has a micro SD card on the front. So all you do is pop in the card, you configure the uh, data log for up to 100 different parameters, uh, up to 20 samples per second. And then you just hold the button down, it starts the data log and it records. We also have a flag marker, so if you have like a knock event or some kind of incident, you can put a marker in that data log. Uh, once you finish, you uh, Quick the SD card out, it's a .csv file, so it's universal file format. Uh, pop into your computer, you can use Excel as the most basic thing, but there's a handful of different uh, data analysis programs that you can use to dive into the data and really see what's going on with your engine. Now those sensor modules that you were talking about just a moment ago as well, uh, these communicate via CAN, so basically you can think of them as an analog to CAN converter? Yeah, that's correct. So we have our own uh, CAN bus network that we call Banks bus. So it's a closed loop system, but yeah, it's all CAN bus, so you only have to run one wire through the firewall. It really simplifies everything, all the modules stack together to really uh, make it compact and easy to wire up for the uh, individual. It's very expandable. Yeah, I think that's probably important to mention because if you are going to be adding a lot of sensors, the wiring can be a real headache. So dealing with just a two-wire bus makes that nice and easy. Look, it's been great to get some insight onto on that product. Chris, thanks for your time there. Thank you very much.